so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Gunnarsson. I work at the Division of External Relations at Lund University, and we are hosting this session today um, where you will be able to learn more about applying for a bachelor's degree at Lund University. And we also have a couple of programs represented here today uh, with, uh, with staff members who will explain the details about their particular programs to you guys. And if you have any questions, you are, of course, welcome to ask uh, anything you'd like uh, related to studying a bachelor's degree and learn. So the programs you'll be able to meet after the presentation today are international business, we have economy and society, and we also have development studies. So three of our most popular international bachelor's degree programs have staff members here today. But uh, I'm actually going to start by showing you guys a presentation about applying to a bachelor's degree program at Lund University. And this presentation, PPT, will take roughly 30 minutes to go through. Uh, there are quite a lot of details, of course, that we want you to be aware of. And hopefully, as well, the presentation itself will answer many of the questions you may have. But if you do have questions on your own that you want to ask us, please use the Zoom Q&A function to, to write your questions and upvote any question that you find there that might be interesting and that you want to learn more about. So please use the Q&A to ask questions and we will handle those after the presentation has finished. Now I'm going to share my screen and show you a PPT. Study your bachelor's degree at Lund University. Um, now we have an agenda. Uh, the presentation and what does it include? Some information about our bachelor's degree programs, international bachelor's degree programs taught completely in English, of course, uh, no Swedish necessary. We will talk a bit about entry requirements to the bachelor's degree programs, what you need to have with in terms of your academic background in order to be eligible. We're going to talk about the various application steps. Uh, maybe you have made an application already, or maybe you're planning to make an application. So what do you need to know? Uh, about this. We're going to speak a bit about tuition fees and living expenses in Sweden. Uh, living expenses, of course, is something that we all need to, to consider uh, before we move abroad to study, so this is very important. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about scholarships and funding opportunities for students as well, and we're going to finish, as I said, with a Q&A session with the program representatives. Now, again, I want to remind you that the programs we have here today are international business, economy and society, and development studies. So these three programs have staff members who will be able to answer your questions. Please use the Q&A, Zoom Q&A at any point during my presentation and after the presentation is finished. Uh, so we can have a look at those together and uh, hopefully be able to provide answers. Now let's get into the presentation. You are here because you're interested, hopefully, in uh, applying to a bachelor's level program at Lund University. So what's the first thing you need to do, really? Well, first of all, you need to find a program, of course. So uh, I would, if I were you, I would go to our website and search for bachelor's degree programs uh, under uh, admissions. Uh, and we have nine bachelor's degree programs that are taught completely in English nine bachelor's degree programs in a variety of subject areas but today we're focusing on business economy and development studies um so nine bachelor's degree programs taught completely in english there are three years in duration full-time studies 180 ects so each program would have its own web page with information about the program content and uh, eligibility uh, entry requirements, tuition fees, etc. So I would advise you to go and study those pages first for the programs that you're interested in before you, you ask your questions to us here. In, because a lot of the information is already published on our website, of course. Uh, you can find answers to most of your questions there. Uh, but if there are things that you're still, you, you, you check the website, you still have questions because there are some detail you still don't quite understand, please go ahead and ask us here today. Now, concerning eligibility and the entry requirements, how do I know if I'm eligible? Well, the general requirements for all students who want to apply to bachelor's level studies in Sweden are that you must have successfully completed your upper secondary school, that is high school uh, studies, 
and have your final documents ready when you make your application. Or rather, I should say, you should have them ready no later than our document deadline, which is February the 1st. So you can make your application today, even if you don't have your final documents, but you must be able to provide your final high school or upper secondary school merits by the document deadline February the 1st. You must also be able to provide proof of English at that point. So no later than February the 1st, you must submit proof of English language proficiency. Now, of course, there are many ways you can prove your English language proficiency. For example, it could be that you have previously studied in an English speaking country like uh, the United States or the UK or Australia, and then you'll get approved for English language proficiency. But if you come from a non-English speaking country, uh, like many of our students do, uh, there, there may be a need for you to submit some other type of proof of English, such as an IELTS test, 6.5 average, or TOEFL, uh, 90 uh, average needed there in order for you to prove your English language proficiency. Then, of course, there are also country-specific requirements. Now, this is related to the country where you, you, where you finished or you completed your upper secondary school studies. So if you previously studied in Brazil, there is information on the University Admissions in Sweden website for you. You have to check for Brazil. If you studied in Tanzania, you check Tanzania. If you studied in China, you check for China, etc. Uh, and there they will tell you, A, how you prove your eligibility, what makes you eligible, basically, and B, what documents you need to provide to prove your eligibility. It could be that they need to see, for example, your transcripts, of course, your completed transcript for all years of upper secondary school, and also provide some kind of proof of graduation from upper secondary school studies. Um, oftentimes, and I'm saying this because it's very important when you provide your documents, it's very important that if you come from a non-English speaking country, documents usually need to be provided both in the original language, your native language, and also in an officially certified translation into English. Um, so it's not enough sometimes to just send, send in the documents in English, for instance, you must also provide them in your native language. Of course, if they were only issued in English because you studied in an English speaking country, then that's enough. Now, the programs may also have certain requirements for you, usually related to the type of subjects you need to have taken at uh, during your upper secondary school studies in order to be eligible. Uh, it could be that you have need to have reached a certain level in, for example, mathematics or social studies that we have here today. The three programs will require, for example, that you have previously uh, studied social science during your upper secondary school studies. Um, and some of the programs also have a requirement for mathematics that you need to have reached a certain level. Um, you can check the program web pages again to see what they require. Now, the requirements are actually based on the Swedish upper secondary school system. So it may be somewhat problematic for students to, to figure out if they're eligible or not. And university admissions in Sweden on their webpage for bachelor's applicants for some countries, they have a pretty detailed information about how you can check eligibility compared with your home country's upper secondary school system, but they don't have it for all countries, I'm afraid. So sometimes we will have to ask students to actually make an application without fully knowing or truly knowing if they are going to be considered eligible or not. But we do ask that you do your best to try to figure out if you're eligible or not before you make an application to avoid disappointment later. So when can you apply? Well, you can apply now, today, if you want to, if you haven't applied already. Uh, of course, we opened our application system for international programs in mid-October, so we've been open for two months already. And we're going to stay open for another month. So the last day you can make your application online is January 16, 2023. Uh, so we're open another month. Um, and until that point, you can add programs, you can remove programs, you can rearrange the way you have ranked your program on the University Admissions in Sweden website. After that date, your application is locked and you cannot change anything. So the first deadline you need to be aware of is January 16. You must make your application online before that date. Then there is a second deadline. Now, the second deadline is all about your supporting documents. 
and the application fee. So all your supporting documents are due no later than the 1st of February, 2023. We cannot accept or consider your application if you provide vital supporting documents after this date. So February the 1st. Uh, that is also the deadline for you to either pay the application fee if you're fee liable or prove that you are application fee exempt if you are fee exempt. So that's a very important deadline and it's a firm, sharp deadline. Do not do anything after this deadline because then we may not consider your application. Then you have to wait a little while until early April uh, when the admission results are announced. So April 5, 2023, the admission results are announced on your University Admissions in Sweden account. So you need to log in on that day to find out if you have been offered admission to uh, one of the programs you have applied to or not. So this current application round, which closes on January 16, it's open for all students, Swedish students, European students, and students from any country in the world. So all students all over the world should and can apply now. However, there is a second admission round, a second application round. Sometimes it's called the Swedish application round because it's mainly uh, designed with the needs of Swedish upper secondary school students in mind. So this application round is open between March 15 and April 17, 2023. So Swedish students and students holding EU, European Union citizenship, may choose this application round uh as well or instead if they haven't finished their studies yet so that is an opportunity that is not available for non-eu or non-swedish uh non-eu citizens basically i could say because you would need to uh, apply for a residence permit to to come to sweden and join us here at learned university and in the second admission round there simply is not enough time for you to do so um so you will not be able to join us so in the second admission round please only EU citizens. All right, so let's have a look at the application steps, how to make a successful application. First of all, as you may know, at this point, maybe you've made your application already. Uh, we have something called University Admissions in Sweden. It's a national application portal, national application system that all Swedish universities use. So you would go there, you would create an account, it just takes a minute. You need to provide some personal details and uh, your valid web, uh, sorry, email address. And that's enough. Basically, you create an account. It's very quick, very easy. Make sure that you use an email address that you check regularly. So you don't, uh, I mean, uh, create a, a new email account, an email that you don't check so often because this is the only way for us to communicate with you uh, both the you know the university or universities that you have applied to or that you will apply to and also university admissions in sweden staff members if they need to contact you for some reason they will do so via email so it's vital that you are connected to your email account and check it uh, on a regular basis to find information from us and university admissions in Sweden about your application. Uh, so this is very important. And also, I want to say, just use one account. Uh, it's not allowed to use multiple accounts uh, because sooner or later, university admissions in Sweden, they're going to check to see if a person has multiple accounts. And if they do uh, find multiple accounts, it will merge the accounts. And then there is a real risk that information will be lost. Maybe your supporting documents that you have provided to one of the accounts, they, it gets deleted because they're merging these accounts. So just use one account. Now, of course, the next step, you have created your account, you logged into the University Admissions in Sweden website, you need to select the program or programs that you're interested in. Now, if you're applying for bachelor's level studies, you may apply to up to eight different programs. And these can be all in one university, all at Learn, for example, or they can be, you know, one or two programs in Learn, one or two programs at another university in Sweden, and so forth, because that's the national application system. Uh, but you have to rank your choices, of course. Uh, so this is something that is super important. And why do we ask that students have rank their choices in order of preference? Well, first of all, very important, you can only get one admission offer. So just to give you an example, let's say that you have 
you've decided to apply for four programs. One, two, three, four. Now, the first program you have applied to, they will have the first chance of offering you admission. If they do offer you admission, which we hope, of course, for your sake, then programs number two, three, and four, they cannot offer you admission. If program number one, for some reason, does not want to offer you admission, they delete your application or they put you on the reserve list, then program number two can have a chance to admit you. But in the end, you can only get one uh, offer from one university and one program. So it's very important that you rank your choices in order of preference, meaning that program number one, the, the, the program you rank as number one, that has to be the program that you really want to get into the most. That's your top choice. That's the one you really want to go for. Programs number two, three, four, five, et cetera, if you do uh, add those to your application, they will be backup options, backup options. So not your first choice, or but your second and third backup options. Um, if you really want to come to Learn, Learn University is a popular university. So many of our programs, and certainly do, those that are represented here today, are some of the most popular programs in all of Sweden, meaning that it's quite competitive. So if you truly want to have a chance to get admitted to one of our programs, please do rank them as number one and two or three. Um, because if you do it, you know, if you rank them as number five, six, seven, or something like that, chances are you will be offered admission somewhere else and then you cannot get into Learn. And that's the way it works. Also, of course, some importance is the fact that we can only offer you a scholarship if you have applied for Lund as first-hand choice. There are no scholarships for students who have applied to us as a second, third, or fourth choice. Now, after you have made your application online, you've selected your programs. Maybe it's just one, maybe it's eight. It's up to you, uh, but you have to rank your order, uh, them in order of preference, of course. And then the next step for you would be to submit the required documents. Now, the documents you need, as I have kind of mentioned earlier, is completed record of upper secondary, that is high school uh, level uh, studies. So all years of upper secondary school or high school must be included in your documentation. Also, proof of graduation some kind of degree certificate uh, or graduation certificate um, if you get that in your country. We don't, I mean, I know that in some countries you don't get such a certificate, but if in your country you do, that must be included. Now, also very important, these documents, if they were issued in a non, not in English from the beginning, maybe they were issued in your native language, uh, then they must be provided both in the native language and in an official translation into English. Um, now, official here basically means that it could be A, they are issued by your school, and that would be great, fantastic, if they can issue uh, documents in English. But if they cannot, for some reason, you have to go to a professional translation company to do it for you. You cannot do it yourself or your friends cannot do it for you. It has to be an official translation into English, if needed for your country. Now, you also need to provide proof of English language proficiency. As I said, it, this can be done in, in a few different ways. If you studied in an English speaking country, then most likely your academic merits will be enough. Your high school merits, upper secondary school merits, that will be enough. But if you studied in a non-English speaking country, you may need to provide additional proof of English language proficiency. And that could be, for example, an English test like IELTS, TOEFL, uh, Cambridge, ESOL, Pearson, et cetera. There are a couple of different tests. Of course, the most common ones tend to be IELTS and TOEFL. You also need to provide identification documents, uh, an identification document of some kind. Usually that would be a scan of your passport or your national ID card. Uh, for EU citizens who need to prove that they are indeed EU citizens, that is also mandatory in order for us to know that you are fee exempt, of course. As I mentioned previously, it's very important that you check the country specific rules for, for your country, because there you can learn both what documents you need to provide and also how they should be provided in what way. Now, for most students in most countries, you should be able to scan your original documents and upload them to your account uh, at the University of Missions in Sweden. But occasionally there may be people from certain countries who would need to, for example, have their high school or upper secondary school sent the documents on their behalf 
from the high school to university admissions in Sweden. So please do check what applies for people coming from your country or who studied in your country before. And you can find that information on the University Admissions in Sweden website. And I would, you know, don't uh, dismiss this uh, and think, well, I'm, I'm sure I'm eligible. Please check the information, regardless of where you come. It doesn't matter if you're from Germany, South Africa, Australia, Canada, any country in the world, they would have specific instructions for what you need to provide and how to provide your documents and follow the instructions carefully on the University Admissions in Sweden website. Because if you don't, and University Admissions in Sweden say, well, look, we cannot accept this as proof of your upper secondary school merits because you didn't provide the documents in the correct way. There's nothing we can do at the university. Uh, it, your application and supporting document, they have to be approved by University Admissions in Sweden in order for us to consider your application. Now, the final step for most people would be to either pay the application fee if you are fee liable. Non-EU EA citizens are for the most part fee liable. So you need to pay the application fee. If you do not pay the application fee, your application will not be processed at all. Uh, we, just to preempt this question, because it may come, uh, we cannot uh, offer fee waivers either. So if you are fee liable, you have to pay the application fee. There is no way around this. If you are fee exempt, uh, EU citizens are fee exempt, you need to provide proof of your citizenship to University Admissions of Sweden in order for them to process your application. So they will go in, they will look, oh, this is an EU citizen, we see the passport, then they process your application. But you either have to pay or prove that you're fee exempt in order for your application to get processed at all. Now, the deadlines that I mentioned are firm. Uh, there's no way that we can kind of uh, say that, oh, okay, you will give you another week or two weeks to provide supporting documents, for instance, depending on the situation or, or particulars of your situation. These deadlines are strict and must be followed completely by all applicants. Uh, so January 16 is the deadline for you to make your application online on the University Admissions in Sweden website. You create an account, you go to University Admissions, select the program or programs that you want to apply to, you add them to your application, and then you click Submit. And then you will get a confirmation email saying that you've made an application to Lund University and other universities, of course, that you may apply to as well. Uh, so you must do so before January 16. After that, your application is completely locked and you cannot change anything. Now, after January 16, you have an additional two weeks until February the 1st to A, provide all your supporting documents, and B, also pay the application fee or show that you are fee exempt. They are firm deadlines again. I'm sorry for repeating myself, but this is very important for you to understand that you cannot delay anything here. Uh, the earlier you can complete all these steps, the better, in my opinion. So what happens to your application exactly? Well, uh, when you make your application, provide supporting documents and pay the application fee, it will be processed at the national level by University Admissions in Sweden. And they have to approve you. Uh, they have to approve your supporting documents and your application in order for us to consider it. Um, so that's basically what happens. It's quite, it's quite an automatic process, I would say. Uh, the admission results are announced on April 5, 2023, for all applicants, um, and July 12, if you use the second admission round, but that is just for EU citizens. So for other international applicants from all over the world, April 5 is when you will find out if you're offered admission or not. Now, non-EU citizens are generally required to pay tuition fee to study in Sweden. Uh, and the tuition fees can be different from program to program. So please check the program details for information about the exact tuition fee for your program. Also, of course, for all students, regardless where you come from, uh, if you're Swedish, EU or non-EU, doesn't matter. We all have to be able to cover our living expenses. And here is a kind of a handy rough 
budget, student budget for uh, on a monthly budget, I would say. So in Swedish krona, we recommend between nine and 10,000 Swedish krona per month. And euros, that would be between 800 to 900, depending on the exchange rate, of course, as we know, the world economy right now is quite unstable, I would say. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen next year or even a week from now. Uh, but at currently, around 800 to 900 euros is what you need in order to subsist here uh, for one month. And US dollars, that would be 840 to 930. Uh, so you can see here the breakdown of housing, food, course literature, and other expenses, such as leisure activities, some shopping, going for a coffee, paying your mobile phone bill, et cetera. Uh, this is a kind of a, I would say, pretty normal student budget. Uh, it's not too much, it's not too little, it's just enough to get by on and live a, a decent, you know, typical student lifestyle, I would say. So this is what you uh, would need, more or less, around or between nine and 10,000 Swedish krona per month. Now, non-EU citizens will need to apply for a residence permit uh, to join us here for studies. Uh, so what happens is that you would get your positive admission result, hopefully, in the spring, uh, April 5. And when you have received that, you need to A, pay the first installment of the tuition fee, and B, apply for a residence permit. Now, residence permit applications uh, are made through uh, the Swedish Migration Agency. So you make an application to the Swedish Migration Agency, you do that online. And then depending on where, what country you come from, you may need to visit the Swedish embassy or general consulate in that country to show them your passport and or provide biometrics before they can issue a residence permit card. Now, this process can take a while. The earlier you apply for a residence permit, the better. So our recommendation is to do it as early as possible. Uh, of course, after you have received your admission offer and also paid the first installment of the tuition fee, uh, those conditions must be met before you can make a residence permit application. And then it can take you know anywhere from a couple of weeks to sometimes more than two months to get the residence permit approved. And you need that time uh, to plan everything for your you know uh, coming here to Lund in mid to late August. 2023. For EU EEA citizens, you do not need to apply for a residence permit. You can just come here and join us, but you must have a plan to fund your living expenses, of course, uh, because we all need to pay the rent. We all need to purchase food and buy books, etc. And that applies to international EU and Swedish students alike. There are some scholarship opportunities for non-EU citizens. We have something called the Lund University Global Scholarship, uh, LUX, the acronym LUX. And that is a scholarship that is awarded to some students every year. Uh, most of the scholarships go, uh, I would say, to master's level programs, but some for bachelors as well. So you may make an application for a Lund University Global Scholarship. We offer in this program partial tuition uh, but no living expenses. So you can apply, maybe you want 25% uh, fee waiver, 50%, 75%, even up to 90% uh, tuition fee waiver. We open for application in early February. It's not possible to apply for the scholarship yet. You first must make a complete application for a program or programs at Lund University, submit all your documents and pay the application fee by February the 1st in order to have a chance to even apply for the scholarship. So we will invite eligible students to apply in early February. And this scholarship program is just for non-EU fee liable students. So Swedish students, EU students who are fee exempt cannot apply for the Lund University Global Scholarship. We also advise students to check for country specific scholarships because there are many countries around the world where they have national scholarship programs for students who are going abroad to study. So please uh, check if your country has such a scholarship program and make an application in a timely way. Uh, could be also other funding agencies, funding bodies where you potentially can either get a scholarship or get some type of funding or a student loan. Uh, to cover your expenses here in Sweden. It could be a bank, it could be some other type of funding agency that you may have in your home country. There are no such agency in Sweden who will grant loans to international students. So you must get that from your own home country. 
uh, have a realistic plan here uh, or have a plan A, B and C, because if you're just relying on getting a scholarship to come here, that's a pretty weak plan, in my opinion. Uh, you need some other backup uh, plan. If you truly want to come here, you must start looking for funding opportunities now. All right, so that's quite a lot of information. I'm just going to make... Uh, a summary uh, before we go to the Q&A and handle your questions there. So top tips for a successful application. First of all, try to make sure that you meet all the entry requirements before you make an application. Make sure that you're eligible uh, because if you're not eligible, if you don't meet the entry requirements, I'm afraid we can't offer you admission even if you are a terrific student. Check the country specific pages for bachelor's applicants on the University of Admissions in Sweden website. Um, they will tell you exactly what you need in terms of your uh, previous study background and also the documents that you need to provide and how to provide them to University of Admissions in Sweden when you make your application. And because the instructions and information is slightly different from country to country, you must make sure that you have the information that is you know, relevant for where you studied previously, your country. Um, because if you have a person or a friend or someone from another country who made an application and they told you some information, maybe that is also valid for you, but maybe it's not. So you need to find out what applies for students who come from your country. Make sure that you can uh, submit accepted proof of English, of course, uh, by the document deadline February the 1st. Uh, if you need to take a test, such as IELTS or TOEFL, um, that is something that you need to do now uh, or very, very soon, uh, because you must be able to provide proof of English, the result of these tests, uh, by February the 1st. So if you take the test on January 25, maybe you cannot get the official result in time before February the 1st, and that would jeopardize your whole application. So make sure that you're able to find or provide proof of English no later than February the 1st. Choose and rank the programs in the order that you want, in order of preference. Your number one program, program number one, that's your top choice. That is the program you really want to get into the most. Number two, three, four, as I said, backup options. If you need to pay the application fee, non-EU students often need to pay an application fee, 900 Swedish krona, which is around 80 euros. You have to pay this fee no later than February the 1st, otherwise your application will not get processed. And again, unfortunately, we're not able to provide fee waivers, application fee waivers. We do not have that. Um, actually, the, the fee uh, goes to University Admissions in Sweden. It doesn't go to Lund University. We don't collect the fee. We don't want the money. You pay to University Admissions in Sweden and it's their service charge for processing your application. Moving on, your official documents, of course, very important. Organize them early on, gather them now. Make sure that you have all the documents you need in order to prove that you're eligible for higher education studies in Sweden. Submit them as early as possible if you want a chance to get feedback from university admissions in Sweden on them. They will tell you if there's something missing or if you haven't corrected the right set of supporting documents. So the document deadline, again, February the 1st, everything has to be in by that date. All your official documents, proof of English, your ID, some type of ID like your passport. Uh, and also you must either pay the application fee or prove that your fee accept. February the 1st, do not miss. Yes, stick to the deadlines. They are strict, They're very strict. <laughs> but the, the system has been designed this way to be to ensure fairness and that it's equal for all students. So no one gets special treatment, basically. Uh, regardless where you come from, it's the same rule. If you're Swedish, it doesn't matter. If you're EU, it doesn't matter. If you're non-EU, it doesn't matter. You all have to follow the same rules and submit the same documents. Please check your University of Admissions in Sweden account regularly to find information about your application status, uh, because it could be that University of Admissions in Sweden, when they process your application, if they find anything that is uh, not correct, they will let you know, they will give you information, and they will also give you a chance to correct your mistakes. And you can do so, but no later than February the 1st. So February the 1st, again, that deadline, everything has to be completely correct. 
uh, by that date in order for you to have a chance to compete for a place in one of our programs. Also, we want to communicate with you throughout the application process and email, that is the way we communicate with our applicants. So make sure that you check your emails on a regular basis uh, to find information from us or University of Missions in Sweden. All right, that's it for my presentation. I almost, yeah, half an hour. I It was a lot of information, a lot of things to think about and to digest. Uh, but at this point, actually, I'm going to invite our programs to join the session. We have programs here today. Yes, Igor is joining. We also have Karin and Håkan. I'm going to actually ask all of you to uh, introduce yourselves and the program, um, the bachelor's program that you represent here today. And I'm going to invite you in the order that you appear on my screen. And Igor was first to join. So Igor, please introduce yourself and the program that you represent. Yes, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Igor Klicinich. I'm an academic advisor at the Department of Business Administration and also the program coordinator for the International Business Program. So the International Business Program is, as you had mentioned before, it's a three year long program uh, taught in English and it is aimed at recent high school or secondary school graduates who have a strong academic background uh, an interest and ambitions in international career uh, and a drive to gain knowledge and skills within the field of international business, of course, as well. Uh, the program itself offers students uh, a students a vast focused curriculum, uh, mainly in business, but also in economics, statistics, uh, business law, information systems, and also economic history. Um, students on the program are also uh, yeah, they are offered and gain international perspectives from faculty members, teachers, and other fellow students. Uh, and quite a lot of the program is team-based, uh, team-based projects aimed at enhancing cross-cultural learning. Students also receive the opportunity for an internship during our fifth elective semester, and also uh, exchange studies instead of the internship, if that is uh, something the students would prefer. Uh, students train in quite advanced problem solving skills in an international context and learn theoretical concepts, models, and tools uh, that are derived from relevant research with the overall purpose of preparing themselves and being prepared for a career in international business. But also, if they would like to continue their studies on a master's level, the program prepares the students for further studies in business and uh, business administration. All right. Thank you, Igor. Uh, I, we can also say, I think we have to brag a little bit here, or you can brag, not me, but you, uh, that you represent actually the most popular bachelor's program in all of Sweden, don't you? Uh, international business is uh, is one of the, no, it's the most popular bachelor's program in all of Sweden. So it's highly competitive, <laughs> I suppose. It is, it is indeed. It's quite, quite competitive, and we have uh, applicants coming in from all over the world as well. In mm. places. Yeah. Thank you, Igor. And next on my screen, we have Karin Lindkö uh, representing the Bachelor's Degree Program in Development Studies. Karin. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Karin Lindkö. Uh, I work at the Department of Human Geography, and I'm the coordinator of the Bachelor's in Development Studies that we at sometimes call BIDS. So that's the abbreviation of this. BIDS is a three-year program. It's full-time studies in English. Uh, we have both uh, Swedish and international students. It's an interdisciplinary program, um, and you can major in uh, one of the four subjects, uh, human geography, uh, economic history, uh, sociology, or political science. So during your three years, you choose one of these four subjects to do your major in. Uh, we also uh, have one semester of elective courses, um, and we have then students who choose either to go deeper into one of the four uh, subjects I just mentioned, or to choose another subject which may be relevant for development studies. That could be, for example, climate change or gender studies. Uh, then we also have the opportunity to do an internship during the final semester. Um, before you do your bachelor thesis. 
Okay, yeah, I think that's it. You can ask more questions in the chat if you have further bits. Thank you. Uh, development studies is is a program that has we've uh, been running this or offered this program for a, a quite a long time. So it has produced a lot of alumni, right? And uh, I don't know if you do you have any kind of do you keep track of your alumni, Karin? What what do they do after they finish their their bachelor's studies? Uh, we've actually had a super nice alumni talks uh, for the ongoing uh, bid student this semester. Um, many of our alumni do uh, want to continue for a master, either in one of the four subjects that they choose or a different one. Uh, but then we also have alumni who would like to go straight out in the <laughs> in the real life <laughs> to work. Uh, and we have many of our students go for the international organizations. It might be small NGOs, it might be the larger organizations such as the Red Cross or the UN. But uh, yeah, international development sector in some kind of organization, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's where most of them end up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we have Eager from Business Studies, Development Studies, Karin and Håkan from Economy and Society. Welcome, Håkan. Yeah, uh, thank you. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Håkan Nobel. I'm a program coordinator on economy, economy and Society program. It's also a full-time program, three year in completely in taught in English, like the rest of the programs. And it's aimed uh, to you as who are interested in economy, how the economy works and society works in in uh, in the country, region, or global perspective. Um, in this program, you will learn a lot about. Uh, how the economy, the world economy and different regions have developed into the structure that we are in today. Uh, you will also get a basic economics training. And we, the, this, this is the basis of the program. And we also supplement it with uh, uh, sustainability studies, some demography, and also quite a lot of uh, skill training, such as data collection and, and research design. Okay. Uh, there is also quite an opportunity to uh, uh, select your own profile uh, with some, uh, some uh, elective studies during semester five, where you can create your own profile. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of questions that come in, but none uh, are so much about the kind of program specific details. It's more about when you can make your application and and uh, stuff like that. So I would just like to advise all um, participants here today or attendees that I have posted a link in the chat, uh, the Zoom chat, with uh, a direct link to the University of Admissions in Sweden page for country-specific instructions. Now, as I said during my presentation, it's vital and very important that you check for your country where you completed your upper secondary school studies, A, how uh, you can show that you're eligible for uh, higher education studies in Sweden, and B, what documents you need to provide in order to prove your uh, eligibility. So this is super important and something that all students, regardless of where you studied previously, you would have to check this information to find out. This is the official information concerning your uh, background for the country where you completed your studies previously. Um, now let's go back to Igor. Uh, and I mean, these programs that we have here today, Development Studies, International Business, Economy and Society, um, they are not technical programs, but international business, you do require a certain level of mathematics. Can you explain, Igor, in what program, what, how important is that subject? I mean, mathematics in specific. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, to first and foremost, students need to have uh, corresponding to the Swedish mathematics B or at least C uh, level of mathematics, which denotes like knowledge of how to solve mathematical problems involving polynomial, rational, exponential, logarithmic functions. 
and so on. <laughs> I will go into the details about that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, necessarily, it's not necessary for all the courses, of course, on, on the program, but we have some more mathematically directed courses, for example, accounting, uh, finance courses, economics courses. So students do need to have some kind of interest in mathematics uh, and some kind of skills, at least to fulfill the requirements. Uh, it's not the main subject. It can be, if you're interested in international business, the accounting aspects or the finance aspects, that could become a major within the program. Uh, but everybody should have some kind of interest uh, and knowledge skills within that. All right. Thank you very much. We had a question here, Karin. Uh, I mean, and you can answer for all programs, really. Uh, it, it's a person who, who, who wants to know if they apply to the autumn uh, 2023 and for some reason they fail uh, to get uh, admitted, can they apply for spring 2024 instead? So. Well, the BEDS program only starts at the fall, unfortunately. So, um, so our program at least is only uh, with a beginning in the fall. Yes, and that is, yeah, that is also true for the other program. So uh, almost all international programs, regardless if it's bachelor or master, they only have one intake per year, and that is for fall. So if you want to start in the autumn of 2023 now, oh, welcome back, Fokan. Now we can see you. We we uh, we do need that you to make your application now in this current application round. Um, there is another question for development studies for Marion. Uh, can you tell us, Karin, a bit about the elective courses that you find? Uh, because you have to, correct me if I'm wrong, you have to choose a certain major within the program. Can you explain a bit about that? Yes. So um, the major and the elective courses that starts uh, during year two. So in semester three, you choose one of four subjects. Uh, they are human geography, uh, political science, economic history, or sociology. So that is for semester three, you choose one of these. For semester four, you can choose elective courses. Uh, that is 30 credits of elective courses. Uh, you can either choose to go deeper in any of the four subjects I just mentioned, or you can take the opportunity to do an exchange studies, or you can study at a different university in Sweden, or you can stay at ELU and you can do a different subject that is still relevant for development studies. So for example, uh, for the coming spring semester, uh, we have students going on exchange. Uh, we have students who go to Stockholm University for one semester, but we also have students who stay at ELU. Um, and Examples of what they are studying could be uh, peace and conflict studies, for example, gender issues. We can also see that the climate studies are very popular uh, at the moment. So this is for semester four. You, you can really uh, decide if you want to dive into your main subject or if you want to take the opportunity to do um, a different study. I can say that uh, if you want to do a master in political science, it is important that you uh, keep on studying political science uh, because uh, for the master program, at least at ELU, you need 90 credits. So you will have those 90 credits if you do semester three, four, and then six again when you return to your, uh, to your thesis and final semester. Right, so you have to plan. I, I, that's interesting that you brought this up because I wanted to ask Igor and Håkan as, as well about this. Uh, the elective courses that you may take in, in your bachelor's program, they can also help you become eligible for certain master's programs later on. So th this is something that students need to be aware of. And uh, Igor, how do you work with your students for this? So do you have, do you sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and say, look, if you want to study finance, for instance, on, on master's level, or if you want to study uh, accounting, you must take these courses in the bachelor's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do sit down with students who are looking to apply to certain uh, master programs. But just to clarify something I mentioned uh, before uh, about the 
the program, the international business program is actually quite structured. So uh, five of the six semesters are set courses the students have to take, and the major within the, the program is international business. However, when students do their thesis, uh, they can focus within different subjects within the field of international business. So for example, they could do a thesis in finance, thesis in uh, accounting, organization, sustainability, marketing, and so on, anything that's part of the program as an international business. But when it comes to applying, for example, for a master's program in accounting and finance, our students do not fulfill the requirements for that program unless they take additional courses during their elective semester. So if they want to go with the master's program, if there's a track in corporate finance, they need to study additional finance or corporate finance courses on, on a bachelor's level uh, during the elective. If they want to go the accounting way, they have to study additional accounting courses. So that's something that I can talk to and do talk to our students on an individual basis to set up a plan for their further studies. Usually I inform the students, well, this is well in advance before you apply. Then we talk about it uh, specifically before the application for the fifth semester so that they can have uh, an advance notice for the master application later on. Mm. Very interesting. Hokan, uh, how does it work at economy and society? Do you often have to counsel your students about their elective choices? Yes. Yes, I get a lot of questions about that. And uh, as being a master's program coordinator myself, I know how complicated uh, this world is. And uh, it, the requirements for different master's programs varies a great deal between different uh, universities, different countries. So you, if you're interested in a master's program after the program, our program, you need to uh, uh, look around at, and browse around and between different universities and programs. But I, I will help anyone who have questions about this. Mm. Maybe there's one question that comes up once in a while, and that is students want to know uh, if they successfully take one of your programs, bachelor's programs, are they automatically offered admission to master's? Or... I mean, I know the answer, but I'm <laughs> I'm asking just because to clarify this point. Uh, there, uh, Igor. Uh, no, they're not automatically. Um, they do not. Students do not automatically fulfill the requirements for all master's program. Uh, however, they do. If you take our program in international business, you will fulfill the requirements for certain master's programs in business and business administration here in Lund. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have, I mentioned the accounting and finance program that you need additional courses for, um, but we do have a program in international strategy, uh, strategic management, uh, marketing program. We have a program called managing people, knowledge and change. That's a more organization, human resource program. We have a master's program in entrepreneurship. So those four programs are students fulfill the requirement for whatever electives they take. Uh, and then they need additional electives for the specific accounting and finance program. However, it's really important to know that if you apply for master's programs within different faculties here in Lund or different universities, you need to double check their specific requirements. It's really important. Mm. And it's also a competitive process in itself. I mean, it's one thing to fulfill the entry requirements, another thing to be selected in, in competition with other applicants. Corinne, uh, you also, uh, I mean, you, you you cannot automatically continue and be so selected for admission to a master's based on your program, but there are several master's programs that you can take uh, in Lund, for example, if you finish development studies successfully, right? Yes, uh, there are, but you're not automatically uh, admitted to them. You need, it's a new application round uh, and they are, as you said, quite competitive. Uh, what we have seen for the BIS students is that uh, many of them actually do stay in Lund. Um, the master programs that are most popular, um, I would say is the master political science. And as I mentioned before, then you need to make sure that you read that you take the 90 credits of political science to be eligible for that. Uh, and then we also have the master program at the other departments. So sociology has one, uh, human geography has one master, um, and the economic history also has one. So you are eligible for those. 
Uh, and at ELU, there is also a Master in Development and Management Studies, the LUMID program which is a very popular program. Uh, and we have seen that quite a few BID students also try to uh, move through that track to move into more development and management uh, business. Mm -hmm. Now, I was intrigued here because you mentioned economic history, and that seems to me to be borderline economy and society, uh, the, the bachelor's in economy and society. Do you share courses, uh, economy and society and development, or is it? Big Hawken. Yes, uh, some of our of the program courses is, can be electives uh, in uh, in the bids program. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's possible for a student to uh, if I if I if I'm a development study student, I can still p potentially take some courses with students from other programs, right? So you don't you're not always with the same people in the different courses. No, that is true. Some of the courses are joined with other students. It's the same at, at other departments as well. Uh, at our department where I work, the human geography, um, BID students sometimes meet the students that read human geography uh, as a, a, a freestanding course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'd add that uh, economy and society students uh, study the same economics courses as international business students, so they will meet there, I guess. Okay, so, but uh, that's interesting because I believe, I mean, your programs are fairly uh, big, I mean, in terms of number of students, right? Uh, how, how many students uh, do you have in international business? Is it 60 or more? Uh, we used to start with 60 people cohorts when we started the program in 2017. Uh, for next year, I, I think we will go with the same number as, as last previous years, previous year or two, uh, 70 to 80 students will be admitted. And that is out of a batch of 3,000, 3,500 applicants. So quite mm -hmm. competitive for those seats. Very. Uh, what about development studies? How many students do you admit? Or We admit uh, 80. 80. Okay, 80 so quite students. similar. Some, uh, Hokan Economy and Society is it as big as the other programs? Yes, we are aiming at about 40, 50, something like that, but we admit some more, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, because students want to know the, or want to try to uh, predict the likelihood of, of gaining admission before. <laughs> Before they make an application, this is a human nature, I suppose, but it it is impossible, isn't it? I mean, even if you have more or less perfect grades from upper secondary school, there is there is still no guarantee that you will be offered admission, right? How uh, ego, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, of course, if you have perfect grades, then <laughs> your, your your chances are quite big to mm. be admitted. But it is. Uh, a whole you have the requirements if you fill the requirements and then there's the whole selection process based on your upper secondary school grades um and since students or applicants apply from all over the world to all our three programs it is it can be quite competitive right so i want to ask you all i mean because we get this question all the time is there anything students can do i mean you have your upper secondary school merits and those are you you finished upper secondary school you have your grades etc is there anything else that students can do to improve their chances of gaining admission complete silence <laughs> yeah i mean there isn't is there i mean you we we have to tell students that you you competing based on your gpa completely if you're an international applicant. So the only thing that uh, is is looked at is your upper secondary school GPA, basically. Because we have a question here. If a student is wondering if they have to convert their own kind of or recalculate their own uh, GPA from their country into the Swedish uh, upper secondary school uh, system, but they you do not. So you only need, regardless of where you come from, if it's Germany, Georgia, or uh, Zimbabwe, you just need to take those upper secondary school documents that you have been provided with from your home school and send them to Sweden, to University of Missions in Sweden, and they will convert 
for you on your behalf. Um, so we don't really make for the for the bachelor's programs. We don't make like we don't handpick students, do we? Uh, Ego, how does it work? Can you tell us about the selection? Yes, uh, unlike applications for our master programs, where we do a bit more of handpicking, we look at statements of purpose, like personal letters. We do no such thing on a bachelor's level. So it's strictly speaking just a selection process based on upper secondary school grades. And uh, that's not a thing that we at the department or at the school itself conduct. So it's something that the local admission office does. Um, yeah. Right. So basically, you just need to tell them or inform them that this year we are planning to admit this and that many students and you will receive a list basically of these are the the best those with the top gpa uh, who fulfill the entry requirements uh, exactly exactly right so we have a question here that is not program specific marion is wondering uh, i'm a swedish citizen but i completed my upper secondary studies in the uk what application round should i use um well, Marion, you, if you are an EU citizen uh, and you say you are a Swedish citizen, you can use both the in, so-called international application round, which is open right now, and also the so-called second admission round or the Swedish admission round, which is open in mid-March. Um, right, guys, it, it, it is if you fulfill the requirement already, you can actually apply in both application rounds. Mm. But I, I would probably suggest that you make your application now to to compete for a place in the program uh, if you have international merits as well, uh, Marion. That would be my recommendation. Another question here re relates to English language proficiency. Uh, does it matter? I mean, it, provided that you fulfill the requirement for the basic requirement for English, is a higher score in an English test can that be helpful in any way? Uh, improve your chances of gaining admission? Karin, what do you say? Uh, well, I think as as Igor said before, that it's it's all depends on the on the grade, right? Um, as we do not handpick, but I would say that it will make it easier when you are accepted because all the lectures at our program is in English. The examination is also done in English. There are presentations, oral presentations. It's, I mean, everything is in English. The literature is in English. So of course it will make your studies easier um, if, if you are better skilled in the language. Yeah, I think this is a point that comes uh, quite often also from master's level programs that it's, it's one thing to fulfill the requirement, but then you, you actually have to successfully take the courses and and uh, be able to speak fluently understand what people are saying and also be you know uh write quite a lot uh which is important that you communicate efficiently so while it won't help you with getting an admission offer or not it won't boost your chances per se it's going to help you in the classroom as as Colin mentioned um Ah, so here is a question that's quite interesting for Colin as well, uh, but it is also for all the programs. I have applied to development studies program. That's my first choice. And I uh, apparently this person claims that they are qualified. Uh, is age a factor when we assess applications? Uh, not yeah. at all. <laughs> not at all. No, like, no. And it's quite a mix. Uh, of age, I would see, uh, perhaps not as much as in the in the master programs, but we do have a range uh, of people. Some some students come directly from high school, uh, but some have been doing something else uh, first, especially perhaps with the international programs where they have been out working a bit. So yeah, right, yeah. So there is absolutely nothing we 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 do not look at age or consider age at all when people make their applications. Uh, so if you're 18 or 80, <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, so long as you fulfill the entry requirements and are can be selected in competition. Uh, but Håkan, uh, I would like to invite you to kind of describe who, who are who are who are the students in your program? Where do they come from? What kind of backgrounds do they have? 
Well, I think most of them are, are recently graduated from from high school, uh, but and they have a very strong interest in social issues and economic issues, uh, global issues, and uh, they seem to be determined what they want to study and what they want to do with this do with their uh, education afterwards. All right, Ego, can you can you? Sorry, yeah, and we lost more you. A variety of countries as well, of course. Yeah, Ego, is it the same in international business? Do you have a variety of students uh, from all over? We do, we do. And I can clarify something that I mentioned at the beginning. I said the program is aimed primarily towards recent graduates, which it is from high school. Uh, but we, of course, welcome all applicants. If you're a bit older and this is a dream of yours to study international business, do apply for the program. Uh, as Colin and Milan mentioned, we do not look into age when we select students at all. So uh, uh, we do welcome students of all ages. And we do have students, of course, as Vokan said, most of our students as in economic history, or in economic society are uh, recent graduates between 19 and 22 maybe, but we do have students up to 25 and some that are over 30 as well. So when it comes to the age, quite a big difference from students and culturally as well. People come from all over the world with different perspectives. Uh, of course, the uniting interest is an interest in business, in the international business, cross-cultural studies and the likes, but we have students who are more interested in finance, some are students more interested in organization, sustainability, so that can differ quite a bit. Right. So I think we can say that in, in these programs, students don't have to worry that they are going to be the only non-Swedish person. I mean, it's not going to be... 59 Swedes and one international student, right? It's going to be a great mix of, of people from, from different countries. And Corinne, in your experience, uh, how, how does this, I mean, the fact that you have a lot of people from a variety of cultural, linguistic backgrounds and geographic backgrounds, what is, is that something that makes the program more kind of interesting in a way i mean you get to learn more and hear more perspectives what's your take on this uh, i would say uh, i've also been teaching at the program actually so i think the discussions in the classroom uh, for example during a seminar when you have an assignment uh, we have students from various background with various experience so some come directly from the high school but we also have students who have been working perhaps with development issues somewhere in the world and they can add to this. We have the cultural aspects of how something would work in one country perhaps or one context and perhaps not uh, as easy in a different. Uh, so I think the mix of people is actually a benefit for the program. Uh, also for the teachers, we both have Swedish teachers and international teachers at the department. So you, you will definitely not be the only non-speaking <laughs> Swedish. Oh, right. Um, there is a question here from Lars. Uh, so he's asking if 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 you apply to several programs, one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., and you don't get admitted to your first or second choice, for example, does that mean that there is a lower chance that I would be admitted to my third choice? Because the third choice would say, oh, he he has also applied to some other programs and put them as number one and two. Is this a, a question that anyone is willing to discuss or explain? I could say some brief words. I'm not an expert in it, but uh, if you have a third choice program, you will not be disqualified or frowned upon uh, because you apply to two other programs before that. But if you are admitted to priority one or priority two, as you have talked about earlier, then your application to the lower priority programs will get stricken, so you will not have a chance to get admitted. But for example, if you, you receive a reserve spot on priority one, priority two, you can still be admitted to priority three, and uh, no problem that you apply for the two above programs in that case. Mm. Right, Doris. So I think we, once again, we we're coming back to the point where that basically is that students or bachelor's applicants are not handpicked, uh, just or cherry picked, if you will. They, they you're basically, uh, it's quite an 
automated process, I would say, uh, University Admissions in Sweden, they will determine whether or not you're eligible, if you're eligible, or they will recalculate your GPA, and, and basically you will be placed on a list depending on your GPA and the program that you have applied to. Uh, so it's not that you would be disqualified or any way have any disadvantages for your application just because you're admitted to program number three. Um, let me see here. Let me have a look at the questions. Uh, Paulina is asking bids. Someone has already learned the acronym. I see here, Paulina. You're saying bids, uh, Bachelor of International Development Studies, yes, uh, or Bachelor's in Development Studies. Can the internship be done abroad in a developing country? Uh, is it funded by Learn University? Uh, the internship can be done abroad. That's quite common, actually, that it's done abroad. Uh, it's not that we are providing the students internship. It's uh, up to the students themselves to find it. Um, but I've never been in the issue where a student didn't find uh, something if they wanted to do that. Um, during the pandemic, it was a bit more tricky. We had some do like remote internship, but now we have seen that the world is opening up again and students are again going away. It's not funded. I mean, it is part of the course, right? So, um, but it's not funded per se. There are uh, scholarships though that you can apply for. Yeah. Right. So you must have some type of funding for your to on by yourself. Uh, even though you say there are certain scholarships, but realistically, most students would have to be able to fund the stay themselves. I yeah. Uh, but it's just, I mean, if you stay here in Sweden, or if you. I mean, you need the living cost in Sweden as well, right? Uh, so if you need it Absolutely. here or if you decide to go to um, to an NGO placed in Dar es Salaam. Um, yeah, so, but, but there are some scholarships. Uh, we have quite many students that do the internship. Uh, mainly we can see them for the uh, organizations, but we also have students that goes to the embassies. That's been quite popular internship as well. Okay, Swedish embassies or any type of embassy, maybe they're... we have had both Swedish embassies abroad and also other embassies representing the country that the students come from. Okay, yeah. uh, so we have a question for international business, Igor, uh, related to mathematics. Uh, how, how do you use mathematics within the program or what apps do you use? Uh, is it like Excel and Ma Maple? I don't know what that is myself, but maybe you do. Um, are there any exchange semesters, exchange opportunities in international business? But, but maybe mathematics first. Can you give some examples? Yeah. Uh, mathematics, I'm not a teacher myself, so I'm not part of the courses. Uh, but what I know is Excel, of course, SPSS statistics program quite a lot. Uh, so to some extent, as I mentioned before, you do need to have the basic mathematical knowledge corresponding to the requirements. Uh, it is good if you know more maths. You do not have to be an expert. We do provide some help with, for example, Excel and SPS. As of course, you learn more about the programs and how to use in the software. Uh, but if you do have some knowledge from before regarding the, the software and know how to go about, that is an advantage. Um, so th that's what I would say about the mathematics. I, I'm not an expert, or as we said, Maple and, and other, other softwares. Uh, and the second question was about the exchange opportunities, right? Right. Um, so yeah, during the fifth semester on the program, uh, all students in international business have an elective semester where they can choose their courses. They can stay in Lund, take electives. Uh, they can also do an internship, for example, in Sweden or abroad, or they can go on an exchange semester to one of our partner universities. Uh, I think it's a similar offer in the Economy Society program that we have here for the School of Economics and Management. So that's usually what's the most popular alternative. I would say like 50% of our students choose to go on an exchange semester or a fifth elective semester. I'm sorry, did you say 50%? 50% of our students on the program for the fifth semester choose to go on exchange studies, yes. Wow, that sounds like quite a lot, but maybe that's uh, normal. 
But I, I maybe we can tell students, and I think this is both for economy and society and international business, which belong to the Faculty of Economics and Management, that it is possible for students to go to your website and see examples of exchange partners, uh, partner universities that you may be able to apply to. But of course, the, the, this is also a, the, a selection is made uh, based on certain criteria, I suppose. And uh, so it, it, we, we cannot in advance, obviously, guarantee any student that they will be able to go to the country or university of their choice. Uh, because it's competitive as well. Yeah. Um, There's no, I can just add something. There is no guarantee, as you mentioned, but for our students on the program who do partake and follow up and take all, all their courses in due order, they can apply to several different locations for the exchange. If they cannot go to the priority one, the way they want to go the most, they will have a chance and opportunity to go somewhere on exchange, at least. Mm. Uh, Håkan, is this the same in your program that full like 50% of the students uh, choose an exchange or? I know that many does, but I'm not sure about the exact number, but it, it's about the same as uh, international business that you're many go to exchange studies, many also do internships. Uh, also in uh, private companies, that surprised me a bit, but uh, also NGOs, of course, and uh, governmental and international organizations as well. Mm. So there is a, a pretty strong chance, no guarantees, of course, but pretty strong chance for students who want to do an extra. And we want our students to go out, don't we? I mean, it's... Uh, it's it's just good for for us and the programs that uh, our students can see uh, other universities as well and other countries. Uh, I have a question for the bid program. Do you have a fixed quota for? I don't know. They they just say, do you have a fixed quota, or will you take all students who pass the eligibility criteria? And uh, no, the admission that we have is eighty places. If this is what you're referring to, and I think. For this fall, we had about 11 or 1200 applicants, so we cannot take everyone who is eligible. Uh, there are 80 places and that will be the case for next year as well. Yeah, and so uh, you compete on the basis of your GPA. So if you've fulfilled the reentry requirements and you've done all the things that you need to do before the deadlines, you can compete for a place in the program and competition is based on GPA exclusively. Uh, but there is a, a kind of a related question here because, and this sometimes happens, students have already completed a bachelor's and maybe even a master somewhere else, but they want to go back to school and start from, from scratch. So they want to apply for a bachelor's again, a new brand new bachelor's program. Is that something that you take into account uh, when they apply? Yeah, it happens that students apply, students who have studied on bachelor's level and master's level. Uh, we do not take that into account when it comes to the selection process. So the selection process for the program is strictly based on upper secondary school grades, even though you might have studied a couple of years or more on a university level. However, sometimes you can use university level courses to fulfill a specific requirement. So for example, English, which is taking a program uh, that's deemed to be equivalent to like English speaking requirement we have here uh, that can help you with the requirement, but not in the actual selection process. Right. It summarizes it quite well. Tess, uh, with your question, so uh, it can help you fulfill certain requirements, but it cannot help you get selected to the program uh, because that is uh, based just on your upper secondary school GPA. And also, we I think we want to tell people here uh, that regardless of what even if you have a phd you still have to submit your complete upper secondary school uh, uh merits uh if you want to compete for a place in the program so please do not forget to do so um i i want to go back to hokan again because i have the you you've told us about the program kind of content and and the structure more or less uh, but then students also often want to know after the three years, what can they do and what, what happens to them typically um, after they finish their studies, Håkan? Yeah, um, well, the first batch <clears throat> actually 
uh, completed the program last summer. So we're in the process of uh, make of making uh, an inquiry and, uh, and see what what has happened to them. So, but we expect them to go to different uh, uh, places uh, like uh, government international organizations and businesses, of course, but uh, it would be interesting to see where they have actually ended up. Okay, uh, Igor, wh what about your students? Do they continue uh, to masters or do they join the labor market or do they take a gap year or what happens to them? Um, some, some do join the labor market straight away. Some do take uh, one of our master programs, for example, or gap years. I would say uh, our program started in the autumn of 2017. So our first cohort of students graduated in 2020. So we have 2020, 2021, and 2023 cohorts of students. Uh, and yeah, I would say that some, uh, many of them have some kind of junior managerial positions. Uh, it could be companies, organizations, NGOs as well, uh, in different types of subjects, you know, finance, export, import, uh, many also do apply to master's programs uh, here in Lund, uh, especially international strategic management, managing people, knowledge and change. Some apply to other schools in Sweden or abroad, Denmark. We even have students applying you know, to master's programs in the US, uh, Asia, different places all over the world. But as mentioned before, if you do that, the students apply to the other faculties, other universities in other countries or in Sweden, always bear in mind to double check all the requirements for that specific school, that specific university, that specific country, always important. But yeah, I would say quite, they do take different um, ways in life. Many go on, on further studies. Some do take gap years as well to reconsider and see what they want to do in life. Uh, maybe they want to change subjects, do something else. Uh, but many also go straight away to the labor market and find jobs. Okay. Uh, it's it mostly private sector, would you say, uh, for your program, or is it a mix of private public? Uh, a bit of a mix, but I would say maybe more towards the private uh, when it comes to businesses. But we do have, uh, you can, of course, apply to jobs that are more uh, general organizations. Uh, I don't know, like, any specifics when it comes to that, but yeah, you can, of course, work in NGOs and, and other fields than strictly speaking, private, the private field. Mm -hmm. Well, Corinne, what about you? You've already kind of mentioned this, but could you briefly try to describe for students who successfully take the development studies, bachelor's programs, where, where do they often end up? Do they go to master's program directly or do they work or do uh, NGO style um, activities? Yeah, many do continue for the master program, uh, especially in one of the four uh, subjects, one of the majors uh, that I mentioned earlier, or the LUMID program, which is um, development and management. Uh, but uh, what we have seen when we have had the alumni talks uh, during the fall is that students, our alumni tend to end up in various organizations around the world. So we just had an alumni who is uh, based in Ethiopia at the Red Cross. We also had an alumni uh, joining us from Cairo at the UN department working with risk and management issues. Um, but there is also other sectors related to development, right? So it could be more as a consultant uh, related to development issues. Uh, not necessarily placed in the global south that can also be um, placed elsewhere so we had a one former student joining us from london as well but i would say the development sector is is very oriented towards the ngos or the larger organizations okay thank you uh Håkan, uh, you said uh, that you you they, they just finished uh your first kind of cohort or of students, but it, it seems to me that uh, in, in your um, major, it's kind of a social science oriented uh, program, isn't it? Uh, 
Is that wrong to say that? No, that's that's correct. It's uh, social science oriented, and I think they will be eligible for a number of different masters programs within social science and well, mm. economy, economic uh, subjects. Okay, so uh, we also have relevant master's degree programs for your students, uh, correct? Uh, that could be offered as well in uh, at the Department of, say, uh, Economic History or... Yes, uh, of course, they are eligible for uh, the master's programs that we offer and uh, a few others at the School of Economics and Management as well. Mm. A bit on how you what, what you do on on your uh, elective semester and how and how are you uh, prepare for for application applying for a masters. Okay, uh, Paulina is asking uh, about the teaching style at bits. Teaching, I don't know. Can we? Do you have a special teaching style at bits that other programs don't have? I don't know. Maybe you do. Some have their like the flipped classroom and all that uh, kind of more modern take on teaching but uh, what type of teaching methods do you typically use in bids Karin? so the teaching is quite varied i would say there are lectures um quite traditional lectures uh seminars um group work uh, the lectures are usually not obligatory but highly recommended uh, while seminars are obligatory, um, I would say all the time. Uh, there is quite a lot of group work. Uh, remember, we have quite big classes um, of 80 students. So there is group work. There can be assignment that is both individual or uh, made in groups. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Igor, let me invite you to tell us about like a typical week for a student in your program. Mm -hmm. And when I say typical, I don't mean those kind of elective or internships or stuff like that, but just a regular week for, a, say, a first year student in, in your program. Uh, yeah, regular semester would be, I think, uh, students do not necessarily have lectures, seminars, workshops, eight hours a day, five days of the week. They do have maybe two or three lectures a day, uh, each day, uh, sorry, yeah, each week. <laughs> and then they have quite a lot of group work, it's similar to what Karin said about the BITS program, group works, uh, seminars as well, but also individual assignments that they have to do. So quite a lot of the study time is not strictly speaking in classrooms, it is sitting with the groups. Uh, we have a study hub here at the School of Economics and Management where students are usually active and quite a lot of individual work on the side as well. So I, I would say there is a specific week for any individual student that corresponds to all other students. It can differ quite a bit. Of course, you need to do quite a lot of group work, but depending on how you are as a student, you can do quite a lot of individual studies at home by yourself, or you can come individually here, sit with the other students as well, engage in their studies. Uh, what is most important is the fact that we do have quite a lot of group works and we do have uh, it's based on intercultural context learning. So you have to learn how to work uh, not in a group with people from your own country, but people from all over the world. That's something that's a big part of the program. Mm, thank you. Uh, Hokan, can I ask you, because this is also a question we no one has asked today, but I do get frequently asked how students are examined. Uh, the, the courses that they take, what type of exams do you typically use to test their knowledge, as it were? I think uh, there are some uh, uh, written exams, but most of it is uh, paper writing, writing reports, presenting it at seminars, and and these kind of continuous uh, examination. I think it's about uh, the same uh, style as uh, Karin just mentioned. Okay. Uh, can you explain what type of grading system you use for exams? Who, who would like to speak about that? Is it A to F or is it pass, non-pass? 
uh, or is it uh, what kind of scales uh, do we have, uh, Kari? We have both actually. We most of the assignments uh, are graded A to F, where the F is failure. But we do have some like minor uh, obligatory assignments that could be graded just pass or fail. And so they they might be part of a larger course, uh, and you need to pass them to get the the grade for the whole course. But uh, it could be that there are some of these minor pass or fail assignments, but the the grade for the course is A to F. Mm. Okay, so you you mentioned the F word fail. What happens when you fail, Igor? <laughs> what happens? What happens when you fail? Well, uh, you can always take a re-exam, of course. Um, you should do that to pass the course eventually. Uh, we also have A to F uh, on our courses in general. I could take an example with one course. We can have like three different course modules. Uh, one could be a group work, one could be an individual assignment, and one could be an individual, individual exam. Uh, the group work could be a pass fail assignment, the individual assignment as well. And then you have the exam itself that is an A to F exam. Uh, once you pass an exam, it could be the first time or during a re exam, you cannot retake that exam. So the grade you receive on, a, on an exam is the one you have for the whole course. But of course, if you fail an exam, it is not the end of the world. You do have a re exam opportunity. If you fail that, you can retake that exam a year later. But of course, we do recommend the students to keep up to pace of the program and finish off the courses because uh, new courses, of course, come later on for next year. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. So I, I just think we want to be clear that we, we're not going to kick you out if you fail an exam, but it's going to maybe create some difficulties down the line because. Uh, maybe you have to wait uh, and re to, to retake the exam and it can cause troubles. Um, but at the, at the very end of the program, all programs, bachelor's programs end with some type of a degree project or a thesis writing. Uh, Håkan, can you tell us a bit about that and, and maybe students who do not have that uh, tradition in their home countries, perhaps, uh, that you write the thesis at all, can you tell us how, how does it work uh, when students are, write a thesis? That's true. Uh, we have, uh, you write a 50 credit, 15 credit thesis. Uh, that's full-time work during two months. And uh, in, our, in our program, it's an individual work. You write it yourself. You will be appointed a supervisor, will help you, guide you through the uh, research and writing process. and. Uh, also, in the bachelor semester, you will be prepared with a research design course on methods and, and research uh, theory and methods in research. How do you select a subject or a topic for the thesis, uh, Karin? Uh, can, are you free to do whatever you want, or does it have to be within kind of a more narrow subject? Uh, how does that work? So for the BITS program at semester six, the final semester, you return to one of your four, uh, one of the four subjects. So the human geography, economic history, sociology, or political science. Uh, and within that subject, uh, you choose your focus area for the thesis. This is really your opportunity to dive into uh, something that has interested you along the way throughout the program. Uh, and you discuss your thesis topic with your supervisor um, that you have been assigned. So, so this is a great opportunity to really uh, read further into what you are specifically interested in. I think it's perhaps the best part of the program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at least after you have completed it successfully. Yes. Yeah, it feels great. Uh, what about... Uh, uh, the thesis at the International Business Ego. Do you do it in a team or do you do it individually? Students do their uh, degree project or thesis in uh, in groups of three people. So that's uh, always a group work. Um, and uh, yeah, when it comes to choosing the subject within international business for the thesis, uh, it has to be 
within one of the subjects that's part of the international business major courses. So it could differ. It could be one, one group can do a project in uh, finance, corporate finance, another can do something in sustainability, a third could do something in marketing. Usually students, when they start their sixth semester, uh, they take a course in Knowledge Frontiers in International Business, where they talk a bit more, go into depth with research papers so they can learn more about which subjects they can pick. Uh, and they have half of that semester to prepare for the actual degree project that starts in the middle of the last semester. Okay. All right, so I think we're we're actually nearing the end of this presentation uh, because there are not so many questions coming in at the moment. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. Ego from International Business, Karin from Development Studies, and Håkan uh, from Economy and Society. Always a pleasure to meet you and learn uh, more about your programs and the way they're structured and what the students can experience inside the program. Um, we have recorded this session, so we're going to post it on our website uh, when it's been edited. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining and have a wonderful weekend, everyone.